So that's how enticement worked on a small but fascinating scale, but it, it also worked on a large scale. Beginning in the spring and summer of 1863, as the enticement policy was systematically implemented, we start to see those truly large numbers of contrabands coming into Union lines, particularly in the Western armies. During the Meridian Campaign, for example, Sherman's troops were said to be trailing four or 5,000 contrabands in their wake. He had another 10,000 freed people with him during his famous march to the sea from Atlanta to Savannah, and 7,000 more followed his troops as they marched through the Carolinas. This was military emancipation at high tide, the logical conclusion of a policy of enticement implemented by the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1863. But it wasn't enough to destroy slavery. In the year after Lincoln issued his proclamation, it became increasingly clear to the President and Congressional Republicans that no matter how aggressively the Union Army enforced military emancipation in the South, it could never physically free more than a fraction of the slaves. Think of James Ayers. He had walked onto that plantation with 27 slaves and walked away with six of them. Mm. 21 slaves remained and nobody could be sure that when the war ended, they had been legally emancipated, no matter what Lincoln or Ayers told them. Or think of General Sherman. There were 10,000 freed people with him on his march from Atlanta to Savannah. But in 1860, there were 463,000 slaves in Georgia. Mm -hmm. Lincoln was certain that all the slaves actually freed during the war could never be returned to slavery. But he also came to realize that when the war ended, most slaves would not have been actually, practically free. Lincoln could not have been surprised by this, for no one, in fact, had been more skeptical of the Emancipation Proclamation than he had been. On at least three occasions in the months before he issued it, Lincoln expressed serious doubts that a presidential proclamation would do any good. I can't enforce the, rebel, I can't enforce the law in the rebel states as it is, Lincoln would say, what makes you think I can enforce an Emancipation Proclamation in those same states? It would be, he said, like, quote, a papal bull against the comet. And yet, on January 1st, 1863, he issued it. And having done so, Lincoln drastically altered military policy on the ground in the South in an effort to make it work. But it still wasn't enough to ensure the complete destruction of slavery, and by 1864, Lincoln and the Republicans understood that, which is why they began pushing for a 13th Amendment. The Democrats, having by defeating that amendment in the House in June of 1864, just as that year's presidential election was gearing up, turned the campaign into a referendum on abolition. Everyone understood that if Lincoln lost, there would be no amendment and the war would end with Northern victory, but without abolition. And when he was re-elected in November, Lincoln invested all the political capital his victory earned him on getting that amendment through Congress. I've always been skeptical of the mythology shrouding the Emancipation Proclamation. Lincoln did not free all the slaves with the stroke of his pen. He did not wait patiently for public opinion to catch up with his more advanced views. He did not bestride his times and lead his benighted people out of the darkness. And he was not the only man in America responsible for the destruction of slavery. But he was the only indispensable man. It's ironic, isn't it? that someone so temperamentally conservative as Abraham Lincoln should end up leading the most revolutionary social upheaval in American history. But as a friend of mine once, sent, once said to me, conservatives often make the best radicals. <laughs> they keep their revolutions from sliding into terror and anarchy. Of course, when I say Lincoln and the Republicans were revolutionaries, I don't mean that they were socialists or communists or anarchists. They were never going to march, they were never going to smash wage labor or redistribute the land, nor had they set out to abolish the various forms of discrimination that flourished in the United States of their day. They did not believe in racial or social or sexual equality as we commonly understand those things in the 21st century. 
Yet in their own time, and in their own way, Lincoln and the Republicans were genuine radicals, 19th century radicals, exemplars of that impressive wave of bourgeois revolutions that spread across the Atlantic world beginning in 1776. <clears throat> we Americans are so thoroughly the product of those revolutions. We have so completely absorbed their precepts that we no longer appreciate their explosive implications. The Civil War reminds us of their power. Abraham Lincoln believed that all men and women were equally entitled to their basic freedom, that all Americans of whatever color were entitled to the privileges and immunities of citizenship. He thought it was unnatural for one human being to hold property rights in another human being, and that it was immoral for a master to claim the fruits of a slave's labor. And so he hated slavery. In language that was for him uncharacteristically harsh, Lincoln declared that he had always hated slavery, hated it for as long as he could remember, hated it, he said, as much as any abolitionist. Here was the driving passion that for all of Lincoln's temperamental conservatism sustained him and his fellow Republicans through the great liberal revolution we call the Civil War. As in so many revolutions, the radical impulse once unleashed gathered force with each passing month. Lincoln moved with that revolutionary tide, sometimes taking the lead, never looking back. If that didn't make him the great emancipator, it surely made him our greatest president. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have time for questions, I guess. Yes. Uh, the episode in Kentucky is, is intriguing, but it depended on a misinterpretation. Of yes, that's correct. <laughs> that's correct. It depended on the misinterpretation. It's one of the points I make in the book is that the, the, the proclamation is often <coughs> criticized because it exempted the states over which the Union right. had control and left untouched slavery okay. in the areas over which the Union did have control. But in fact, the greatest effect, greatest immediate effect it had, and not accidentally, was in the border states from which the proclamation was exempted. Like, for example, the black troops is in the Emancipation Proclamation. The border states were not exempted from the black enlistment uh, uh, clause of the Emancipation Proclamation. Within months, the Union Army began opening military recruitment centers for black troops in Maryland and Kentucky. So it's not even technically correct to say that Though they were exempted from the proclamation. They're exempted in very narrow ways, in ways that if you don't look at what's actually happening on the ground, you can misread the, the significance of the proclamation. Yes? Uh, what do you think of the movie? <laughs> <laughs> you have another question? <laughs> Boy, um, I liked it. I think. Um, in broad terms, it was shrewd to focus on the 13th Amendment, uh, uh, because I do think the 13th Amendment is much more important than we all generally realize. It, 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 and it does so in a way, usually when people say the proclamation wasn't enough to free the slaves, they're dissing Lincoln. And the movie manages to have it clear that Lincoln supported the 13th Amendment because he himself recognized the limits of the, of the Emancipation Proclamation. That said, you know, I'm a historian. I, 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 I can't help but pick. So, the Republicans come up with this idea for a 13th Amendment, and they settle on it by March of 1864, and they are unanimously in favor of it. So, one of the central dramatic tensions of the movie that Lincoln must herd the cats and get the, get the conservatives and the Blairite people on, on board and keep the radicals from, uh, you know, chucking, you know, undermining the effectiveness of the Republicans. That Lincoln has to unite these people, it's just nonsense. It's complete nonsense. The Republicans were absolutely unified. There was not a single Republican vote against the, Repu against the amendment in, in either house of Congress in 1864. Lincoln did not have to get the radicals and the conservatives to line up and put him. He didn't, 
And the last person, I said this to my friend in the car uh, on the way over, <laughs> Thaddeus Stevens was the last person to require a basement kitchen le lection, lecture from Lincoln about, about no figuring out what true north was. Stevens understood exactly what needed to be done every step of the way. He was probably the single most important legislator in Congress for pushing every emancipation statute through from the beginning of the war. He understood the war powers better than Lincoln did, and, and so it, it makes Lincoln sort of this necessary figure who's he's necessary, but he, it, it, it does what I always worry about with Lincoln. I really like Lincoln, but like him. <laughs> yeah. Can like we just him. like him? <laughs> we have to worship him? <laughs> yes? If enticement had become part of military policy by 1864, um, and I haven't read your book, okay. I've always been under the impression that Sherman considered those 10,000 previously previous slaves following him to be an impediment. Yes. Um, how far behind Sherman did the recruiters follow? They're pretty close with him uh, along the way. Those, most of those slaves by that point weren't coming because they had been recruited. They were coming no, exactly. because they knew. And most slaves who come to Union, I mean, we're talking about 4 million slaves, 237 recruiters. You know, a, right. they, the, the recruitment effort is interesting but ultimately doesn't work. It's most important in telling you how they thought they were going to get this Emancipation Proclamation implemented. And they learned pretty quickly that the recruiters themselves are frustrated by the fact that by then, you know, the Union Army, this is the great paradox of military emancipation for me, is that the Union Army is overwhelmed, literally overwhelmed by the number of contrabands coming within its lines hundreds of thousands of contrabands, and yet those contrabands are a fraction of the slave population in the South. It's just too big. It's too big for them. They cannot handle that many people as they are, and yet in the end they get maybe 14 or 15 percent of the slaves. They, just, they, don't, they don't even get to Texas, the Union Army. So, uh, you know, the recruitment effort is interesting because it sort of it's important in the context of the way historians have talked about the Emancipation Proclamation because they read the text and they say it didn't do anything. It talks about slaves in areas of the, where the Union has no control. Well, no. They go out and try to get slaves and they, they implement a deliberate policy of enticement and that's what the proclamation is. That's what it does. So it's incorrect to say it, it can't free any slaves because it's areas that have no control. It's important to understand what it did it's important to understand why they came to understand why what it did isn't enough. 